Hi guys, it is a stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in Austin, Texas here in early spring 2019, but we're going to head east to Washington, D.C. today where I have the great honor and pleasure of finally speaking to Dr. John R. McNeil and for those of you not familiar with Dr. McNeil. Uh, John McNeil is an American environmental historian, author and professor at Georgetown University. He received his PhD from Duke University and since 1985 he became a faculty member at Georgetown where he serves in the history department. Mostly, uh, McNeil has held two Fulbright Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a MacArthur Grant, and a fellowship in the Woodrow Wilson Center. This man has quite the resume. McNeil focuses on environmental history, a field in which he has been recognized as a pioneer. In 2000, he published his best-known book, titled Something New Under the Sun, an Environmental History of the 20, 20th Century World, which argues that human activity during the 20th century led to environmental damage on an unprecedented scale. And then in 2016, McNeil and co-author Peter Engele published The Great Acceleration an environmental history of the Anthropocene since 1945 and this is what we're going to be centering in our in our talk today. The Great Acceleration is a term used to describe the initial decades of the Anthropocene, a new interval in Earth's history starting around 1945 when human interference in the Earth's ecology has reached a new intensity. And I could go on with this, guys, but it is time for me to shut up and welcome Dr. John McNeil to Collapse Chronicles. John, come on and say hello, and we're going to dive right into this rousing discussion. Right. Hello, Sam. Thanks very much for that generous introduction. I'm glad to be on the podcast. Okay, so let's... Uh, I, I want a very brief def your definition of the Anthropocene itself, and then we're going to zero in for most of our discussion, mostly picking up around 1945 with the Great Acceleration. But let's start with the Anthropocene. How do you define the Anthropocene? I define it as that uh, interval of Earth history in which humankind has fundamentally altered the governing biogeochemical cycles of the Earth. And by bi um, governing biogeochemical cycles, I mean the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle, the water cycle. But you got to understand, everybody's got their own definition of the Anthropocene. And so mine is by no means uh, canonical and undisputed. But, but the, the bottom line is now, what you generally hear is that humans have become literally a geological force on this planet. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. I vehemently agree with that statement, and part of that is reflected in human influence on these biogeochemical cycles to which I referred. There are several other respects in which humans have become a geological force, perhaps the one that's most uh, easy to grasp is the quantities of Earth moved and human beings outstrip all the glaciers and rivers and various other uh, forces of nature that move earth and rock around as well. So that's a fairly vivid way to understand uh, 
humankind as a geological force. Yeah, I, I wish we could uh, have a picture of what's going on literally next door. Uh, as, we're, as we're speaking, I'm hoping this heavy machinery moving earth around South Austin, Texas is not leading into this interview. Okay, uh, it's been debated over and over again exactly when the Anthropocene began from the invention of fire right on up. But by 1945... It, it's pretty clear to anyone uh, studying this issue that by 1945 we were into it and so you're picking that year as when the great acceleration began and this is a term uh, that's not quite as well known as the Anthropocene so I want to spend uh, quite a while on, on this, which was the subject of your 2016 book. So let's start out w with your basic definition of the Great Acceleration, what it means, uh, just the definition, what it means for humanity, what it means for the planet, and where it's going uh, from here. So take it away, John McNeil. Sure, sure. So the Great Acceleration is a term that was uh, coined, I believe, at a workshop in the suburbs of Berlin a little over 10 years ago. Uh, and either the Australian environmental scientist Will Steffen or I um, coined it to mean that moment in the middle of the 20th century when a large basket of indicators of environmental change began to accelerate in terms of their uh, intensity or volume. I'll give you a few examples of this. Uh, and some of these will be driving forces behind environmental change, and some of them will be straightforward indicators of environmental change. But if you consider the uh, history of <clears throat> carbon emissions to the atmosphere, which is a really important one for climate. And you look at the curve of anthropogenic climate, excuse me, carbon emissions over the last several hundred years or several thousand years, you see a sharp upturn in the middle of the 20th century. That's an indicator. Behind that is a driving force, which is the substantial upturn in the quantity of fossil fuels burned. And that, too, shows a sharp point of inflection on the curve, an uptick in the rate of fossil fuel burning in the middle of the 20th century. And if you look at 20 other indicators and driving forces, whether that is the number of high dams built, the quantity of uh, eroded soils from agricultural fields, the volume of pesticides used, the uh, sulfur emissions, and so on and so on and so on, you see a fairly uh, consistent pattern in which the middle of the 20th century is a turning point before which the rate of uh, environmental change uh, on most of these um, scores was modest, and the rate after the middle of the 20th century was much faster, which is not to say that in every case it stayed much faster. A good example of that is sulfur emissions, which have tailed off uh, since the 1980s and um, the number of high dams built, that number has tailed off uh, since the 1970s or 1980s. But in all these cases, what happened after the midpoint of the 20th century seemed quantitatively, dramatically different from what happened before the midpoint of the 20th century. And there's nothing sacred about 1945 in this. 1950 would be just as good if one's considering a variety of 
variables, indicators, and driving forces, they don't all march to precisely the same rhythm. But they do, many of them, show this mid-20th century turning point. And that's why a lot of people, myself included, think that the scale, scope, and pace of global environmental change since the midpoint of the 20th century has accelerated, and that taken together, this needs to be understood as a phenomenon in its own right, in human history, in environmental history, in Earth history. And so it seemed logical to give it a name. That's the great acceleration. Okay, and it... Read, reading your book, and I've I've gotten through quite a bit of this, and and I highly recommend this this book, uh, the Great Acceleration. I I don't know why it did, did not get quite the play as your two thousand book, because I think in in many ways it's every bit is is relevant. So folks, I do uh, suggest you get this. But one thing that you talk about, I guess, in both of your books. Uh, is the, 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 the two interconnected, I guess, common denominators of this, and I, and I had a very similar conversation with Adam Frank a few days ago, talking about the, the interplay between human population and energy. And I want you to uh, give us your view on on that subject about civilization and and energy and po and population and all of that. How that is underlying the, the 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 great acceleration and what's going on on the planet. I guess that question you can make sense of. Sure. So, for at least twenty years, I have held the view that of all the various forces driving contemporary environmental change, the two most important have been the energy system that we have built and the size of the human population. And I would say in that order. Not to say these are the only important uh, driving forces. I just say that they are the two most important driving forces. And with respect to the energy system, the key characteristic of it is that it's built around fossil fuels and has increasingly been built around fossil fuels since about 1800, since the first intensive coal use uh, in the British economy. And the reason that's important is because uh, mining or drilling for fossil fuels, coal or oil or gas, is a highly polluting business and always has been, despite efforts at uh, regulation, which have moderated the consequences of mining and drilling but haven't eliminated them. Secondly, the transport of some fossil fuels, particularly oil, is occasionally uh, highly polluting, despite efforts to regulate and contain that, which have been moderately successful. And then, uh, most importantly, the combustion of fossil fuels is highly polluting and, as all of your listeners know, contributes and has long contributed mightily to the greenhouse gas loading of the atmosphere. Now, if we had a different energy system built around something other than fossil fuels, the significance of energy to the global environment would be quite different and conceivably rather less. But the system that we have built and that we still have and are still going to have, at least for a few more decades, is extremely important to many of the varieties of global environmental change going on today. And in ways indirect as well as direct. So let me explain that before I go on to population. Okay. The uh, pollution effects, the climate change effects are very important. But there are other aspects in which our energy system – 
is significant. Fossil fuel energy has been cheap energy. Uh, we may not think so if we're paying more than $3 a gallon at the local gas station, but in comparison to any previously available source of energy, fossil fuels have been amazingly cheap. And one of the consequences of that is that all sorts of activities that previously would have been uneconomic have become economic, and some of those are environmentally disruptive. And in combination with various technologies, cheap energy has enabled us to do things that otherwise wouldn't have been done. A lot of tropical deforestation falls into this category. If people were trying to clear tropical forests with axes or hand saws, they would do a lot less of it, and they do, would do it much more slowly. But if they can do it with chainsaws or even bigger machines powered by cheap energy, ultimately uh, petroleum, they can clear a whole lot more tropical forest and do it a whole lot faster. So that is an indirect consequence of the energy system that we have built over the last 200 years. But that's why I think energy is the single most important driving force behind the last 100 years of global environmental change. Population, I would say, is second, and they are uh, related. I'll explain first why they're related. So we wouldn't have nearly as many people on the face of this earth if we didn't have cheap energy because cheap energy is essential to agriculture. And not only in the powering of uh, tractors and combines and so forth, but in the manufacture of fertilizer. And if we didn't use many tens of millions of tons of artificial fertilizer, we would not be able to feed as many people as we can feed. So fossil fuels are essential to food production and therefore to a population that is between 7 and 8 billion at the moment. So that's why, or one of the reasons why they are connected. The reason I think population is important is because many varieties of environmental change are taking place, have taken place over the last uh, 50, 100, 200 years, roughly in proportion to population. A good examples of these would be clearing of land for food production. So people do that when they need to feed themselves and their families. Now, people also do it in order to make money out of uh, palm oil or soy or other plantation crops. But in many parts of the world, a good deal of the forest clearance is motivated by hunger, which exists uh, not exactly in proportion to the number of people on the face of the earth, but um, the need to clear new land is roughly in proportion to the increase in the number of mouths to feed. And there are other respects in which population is important to the scale, scope, and pace of environmental change. Let's say the pressure on fisheries around the world, which is uh, quite dramatic and has um, increased sharply, um, roughly in proportion to the increase in human population. I say roughly because people don't have to eat fish. Some people eat fish more than others eat fish. So the relationship is by no means precise, but it's also nonetheless significant. And as your listeners are probably aware, in the last uh, hundred or so years, human population has roughly quadrupled. And that is a huge part of the Great Acceleration. There's been no era in the history of humankind in which population has quadrupled in a hundred years. There's probably been no period in the history of 
primates, when any species population has quadrupled within the span of 100 years. This is anomalous, unprecedented, and we can be reasonably sure never to be repeated uh, in the future. And it's important to recognize that um, this trend of population growth is weakening and has been weakening since about 1970. That is the maximum rate of growth was achieved uh, around 1968 or 1970. And in one sense, you know, it's a magnificent success in a biological, uh, from a biological point of view, uh, on the part of one species. But uh, I'm arguing that it has had dramatic, disruptive environmental and ecological consequences and uh, will continue to do so. Okay. Now, let me... All right. Let yeah, me keep, uh, keep going. Um, do what historians should never do <laughs> and uh, offer a brief perspective on what the future might hold with respect to these two considerations, All the right. energy system and population. You're offering, so I don't have to dig it out of you. I, this is where I was going to be heading in 10 minutes anyway, but... Uh, I, I appreciate you doing this. So let, okay. Well, it's reckless of me. Okay, uh, but we, we, won't, we won't tell. This will be our dirty little secret. So uh, go, go ahead, uh, John McNeil, and give us a glimpse from your, your understanding of the past as a, an environmental historian. Uh, if you were writing uh, an environmental history of the 21st century, in the year 2200, what do you think uh, your your preface and your conclusions would sound like? <laughs> that that would require great recklessness on my part to uh, answer that question directly. But I will speculate on um, the likely future of what I've identified as the two most important driving forces behind global environmental change: population and the energy system. I'll take population first. I think it's a little bit um, less uncertain what's going to happen in that arena. So the global population growth rate, which was over 2% per year in 1970, is now about 1.1%, and it's falling. It will continue to fall, and the main reasons for this are the urbanization of the human species. Just about always and everywhere, when people live in cities, they prefer to have fewer children than when they live in villages. And secondly, the spread of formal female education. Always and everywhere where female populations are more educated, they prefer to have fewer children. Basically, they got more options in life. So, the trend of greater urbanization is almost certain to continue. The trend of greater formal education for females is highly likely to continue, although there are parts of the world where there's considerable resistance to that. But nonetheless, I think those two forces are going to continue to slow the rate of population growth. And the demographers who look into this while they revise their uh, forecasts and predictions every year, they tend to think that by 2060, 2070, 2080, the global rate of population growth will be uh, right around zero. And there may be 10 billion, 11 billion of us uh, by then. What happens after that is anybody's guess. Might the decline continue and population shrink? Might it stabilize? Nobody really has the faintest idea. That, but the, 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 what? Okay. okay. I, I just want so I, I want to get your take. We won't spend too much on time on this. The big outlier in, in this is Sub-Saharan Africa, which is bucking all of these trends. And considering that Sub-Saharan Africa is also home to the last great. 
cornucopia of, of megafauna. It's the, it's the last place on the planet for there to be a megafaunal extinction. Before we see, and then we'll come back to the globe, I, I just want to get some your quick opinion on Africa. Is the population of Africa going to stabilize before it, it literally results in, in the, the next great megafaunal extinction? Are the fellow earthlings that humans share Africa with going to be able to withstand uh, the, the population bottleneck uh, going on in, in Africa today? Or have you looked into, into that question at all? Uh, no, I haven't, and I'd say it's a, a good question. It's uh, a toss-up. The population of Africa is indeed increasing faster than that of any other substantial area uh, on the face of the Earth, and that is going to put heightened pressure on the remaining megafauna. But uh, as your listeners know, in many cases, those uh, megafauna are the source of um, revenue and um, prosperity for the people who live next door to them in the form of parks and tourism. So the incentive structures are mixed as far as the desire that Africans will have to conserve wildlife populations and the desire that they will have to take over habitats used by yeah. wildlife populations. And I'm not sure which tendency is going to be the stronger, uh, and it may not be the same with respect to uh, every critter. It could be that some lose out, but others, so-called charismatic megafauna, uh, are able to survive because they are uh, revenue generators. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's true for, let's say, uh, elephants, um, but not true for, let's say, uh, gorillas. But I, I don't know. As I say, I think it's a, a bit of a toss-up. Okay. But you're quite right. App population ends are a little bit out of kilter with most of the rest of the world. Afghanistan, too, despite uh, decades of warfare and instability, has comparatively high population growth. Uh, but most of the countries with the highest rates of population growth are in sub-Saharan Africa. Mind you, there are a couple of countries in sub-Saharan Africa of which that's not true, uh, partly because of the ravages of AIDS, but also because of uh, conscious, intentional fertility control. Botswana would be an example. Okay, well, a, a bigger question that, 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 that I have discussed with, with many guests in the past, and I, and I want to get your spin on this, is this whole notion of carrying capacity that while, you know, while we're arguing whether the population is going to, where it's going to reach 10 billion, 12 billion and slowly start tapering off, other people are saying, unless we have a rapid population decrease to usually the figures I'm hearing are, are one to two billion people this whole question of, of a population of over two billion people is almost a specious argument at this point uh, and that anything well, depending on lifestyle and I want to touch on this one particularly get your views on China and India but this whole notion of carrying capacity where are you in on, on on this discussion uh, about what th this literally how many people this planet can hold w w without the the global ecology just completely going over the Seneca cliff so the answer to that is nobody knows how many people the planet can support and while there is, at any moment in time, a carrying capacity, nobody knows what it is, and it's not a constant, because the efficiency with which we can uh, extract from the food, from the earth, the substances that we need, food, water, 
etc., uh, is a variable, and particularly with respect to food. So if you asked uh, Thomas Malthus 220 years ago how many people the Earth could support, he would have been happy to provide a, a rough estimate, and he would have been dramatically wrong because he would not have anticipated yeah. things like chemical fertilizer. So carrying capacity exists as a valid abstract concept, but it is itself uh, not a constant. It is a variable, depending mainly on technology and other things that govern efficiency. So there is no knowable answer to that question. But it's not the only question. There are other issues that make population important. It could be possible to support 25 billion people on the face of this earth, maybe, but is that desirable exactly. is another question. <laughs> and um, for, I would argue from the point of view of most humans now alive, that would not be desirable. And from the p point of view of every other uh, earth, earth, earthling on the planet, sometimes I, I get the feeling, what are people saying? That it is the highest and best use of a planet to figure out how many individuals of one species we can pack onto it. Listening to some of these economists, these, the, these utopian economists, that seems to be what they think. It, it, that it, apparently you do not agree with any economist who believes that the highest and best use of this planet is to see how many people we can stuff onto it. Yes, I, I vigorously dispute that notion. And indeed, I have a lot of trouble with a lot of economic theory, um, which seems to me uh, too often uh, bloodless, abstract, and um, unrelated to the planet on which we are uh, privileged to live. And for many economists, the notion of growth is an inherent good and if resources were infinite, uh, I could uh, accept the logic of that. But since they aren't infinite, the notion of perpetual growth is absurd. And the notion that growth must always be desirable is equally absurd. But it's an important uh, ambition within public policy as influenced by economists. It's one of the big ideas of the 20th century that I think is partly responsible for the e ecological tumult that we have witnessed in modern history. So I'm not on good terms with the um, discipline of economics, even if I'm on good terms with a few economists. But it's still the, you know, with every political campaign, it, it is still the, the, the economy is the darling, is the darling of, of candidates. It, it's, it's the economy, stupid, and environment, environmental issues, while people on one hand will claim, sure, I'm, in, I'm concerned about it, over and over again, right up to the 2016 election, economy, by far the number one a uh, thing that uh, on voters minds and environmental issues are way down the list and at, at what point are, are these two going to start reversing you would think it, it, at some point the economy has to start moving down the list of concerns of voters and, and the environment has to start moving up but, but so far I haven't seen either one of them budge Maybe something will happen different in 2020. What's your spin on, on, on that? Um, I would doubt it. Um, I think there are a, a number of related uh, issues here that uh, keep the economy as a more salient political issue in the United States and in most countries um, and keep the environment a secondary political issue in the United States and most countries. The first of these is the creeping crisis nature of uh, environmental matters. Very rarely are these uh, issues that seem 
that they cannot be kicked down the road a little bit longer. And that climate change is an excellent example of this. People may be concerned about climate change, but they consider it something that is a problem for the distant future, and they apply what economists call a discount rate to the distant future. And in a sense, that's perfectly uh, rational, at least as economists define uh, rationality. If climate change were going to create uh, extreme difficulty tomorrow morning, then the priorities would be reversed. But if it's 15 or 50 years from now, well, people apply a discount rate so that that's not uh, going to be a priority. With respect to the economy, there is this insidious uh, dynamic at work. Even if Americans today are far richer than Americans were 100 years ago, they don't necessarily feel that way because they compare themselves to uh, a certain... They don't compare themselves to their grandparents or the great-grandparents or to uh, villagers in Mozambique. They compare themselves to other people they know about within the United States and can easily feel that either they're poor or they're not as comfortable as they uh, could be or should be, not as comfortable and secure as other Americans are. So there's an almost infinite and indefinite capacity for feeling that one needs more. Even if one were to step back and look at the situation uh, from a distance, one would conclude that almost everybody is far more comfortable and secure than their grandparents were. So why is that not enough? It's because of the frame of reference that we typically apply, and that has the insidious effect of making us eager for more consumption, more economic growth, even if that very attitude is almost certain to create difficulties for us in the longer run. Okay, well, let, let's shift a little bit from our, our country, uh, our, our own uh, our own country of, well, you can fill in your own blank, of what we have become in this country. Let's go over there to uh, China and India, and we won't even bring Brazil and, and that guy into this conversation. Let's just talk about uh, the, the devouring dragon and the crouching tiger. Now, I... I think you mentioned in your book that China became the world's biggest energy consumer when? About nine or ten years ago? And China's got, even if their population is shrinking, it's still, uh, and it's going to be well over twice the population of, uh, of the U.S. for years to come. And, and India is going to pass China as the most populous country in, in just a few years. So talk about those two <clears throat> and the, the discussion you were just having about people wanting a bigger piece of the pie. Uh, what, what is that going to mean to the limits of growth and the carrying capacity of this planet, just those two countries? It's going to mean that it's going to get harder to check uh, greenhouse gas emissions and harder to check uh, resource depletion. Now, China first. Chinese population is still growing, but it's going to stop growing fairly soon. But the demand for energy and goods within China is very unlikely to stabilize. China continues to uh, grow economically at what by world standards are quite rapid rates and consumption in China uh, at equally rapid rates. There's very little prospect that that will stabilize. And with respect to India, population is growing and will continue to grow for many decades 
uh, into the future in all probability, although at diminishing rates. And there, too, uh, energy demand and demand for consumption goods uh, is sure to increase at substantial rates. So even if uh, other parts of the world do manage to stabilize or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and their uh, pressure on uh, resources and um, shrink their ecological footprint, um, that will be offset by the almost inevitable growth in China, India, not to mention many other places as well. That's why I think Sam, the energy system is so important. And I didn't get to my vision of the future on that score. Let's go to there now. Then. But, We're 40 minutes into um, this. Your, your vision for our energy future, are we going to decarbonize this global industrial economy in the next 12 years, or are we not? And that question and any other question you want to answer built into that question. So, uh, in the next 12 years, no, but um, <clears throat> I think we're going to do it in the next uh, 50 to 100 years, and we have to do it in, <clears throat> in the next 50 to 100 years, and maybe sooner. We don't really know if there are important tipping points in the climate system. It could be, but nobody knows. At any rate, the reliance on fossil fuels, which now uh, comprise about 75 to 80 percent of the energy used uh, by humankind, that uh, proportion uh, has to shrink. And this, I think, is the topmost priority for public policy in the world, trying to hasten the day when we witness the next energy transition. The history of energy transitions, let's say, for example, from biomass to coal, from coal to oil, suggests that these are not instantaneous. They take a while. And that's mainly because there's an enormous amount of fixed investment in whatever the current energy regime might be. So that's all the more reason to use public policy to advance the day when we have a different energy regime, a different energy mix. Nobody knows exactly what that's going to look like, but the probability is strong that it will be more diverse, which is to say lots of different things will contribute in small ways to the total pie solar energy, wind energy, geothermal energy, etc., etc., etc. And none of them will have the dominant role that fossil fuels have acquired over the course of the 20th and early 21st century. If we don't do that, then the almost inevitable growth in energy consumption in China, India, and elsewhere will mean that we do not check greenhouse gas emissions and uh, barring some uh, geoengineering miracle or um, <clears throat> geological oddity, we will find the planet heating up faster than it is heating up now. Uh, I, I, so that's why I think the energy system is so fundamentally important <clears throat> and um, it's probably not wise to leave it to the market to bring about that energy transition. It's probably wise to focus public policy around the world on hastening that energy transition. Do you see in any real evidence that that is happening? I mean, we don't. We can, we can start at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue uh, trying to find evidence of, of, of that. Um, are you personally optimistic that the politicians uh, running the show here, starting with Donald Trump and, you know, I mean, from U.S. to Russia, this new guy down in Brazil who has shown up on uh, 
I personally do not see the the political will, and much less the individual will, to uh, to even begin to uh, take this problem as seriously as needs to be. What is your spin on that? Well, the example you mentioned, the White House, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Putin in Russia, they are all um, committed to uh, deepening the uh, reliance on fossil fuels, which is uh, exactly the wrong thing to do from the point of view of the welfare of the human species. But uh, that's not what they're concerned about. They're concerned with more uh, personal agendas. Uh, there are a few um, somewhat more cheerful uh, prospects. They tend to be not at the at national level, but uh, in this country at state levels and uh, in modest-sized countries around the world, which means that their total impact uh, isn't that great. Although you, get, you have to give the Chinese leadership some credit here. Even though their emissions uh, continue to grow, they have invested more than anybody else in solar power, and the odds are if there are further breakthroughs reducing the cost per kilowatt hour of solar power, that they're going to come out of China rather than out of the United States or Europe. And that is exactly what, what we need. We need technological advances that will make fossil fuels uncompetitive in the marketplace. And then we'll get an energy transition. If we do not get that, and fossil fuels remain the cheapest set of alternatives available, then I'm not at all optimistic. And what that means is, with runaway climate change, we would probably take the gamble of geoengineering which scares the bejesus out of me. Yeah, so what, uh, what are your fears about, uh, about geoengineering? I, I call it a frying pan versus the fire choice th that humanity is looking at. Uh, runaway climate change or geoengineering, take, take your choice, frying pan or fire. Do you, or, or, do you agree with me on that? Or what are your well, concerns what, about geoengineering? What, me about geoengineering is that you can never do only one thing when you intervene in ecological systems and when you intervene in grand uh, biogeochemical cycles which is what some of the geoengineering proposals uh, amount to you're taking a gigantic risk with the stability of the planet and I don't wish to see those risks taken. Uh, now, it could be that there will be um, n new ways to moderate the impact of um, greenhouse gas loading of the atmosphere that would not entail dramatic risk, but I'm not aware of any at the moment. And the leading idea in circulation, the injection of sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere, that uh, I think uh, it falls into the category of one of those things where you can't do just one thing. You might be able to reflect sunlight back into space, but you'd be doing other things wow. at the same time with consequences that are hard to foresee and some of them could be highly deleterious. So I'm not in favor of geoengineering, although I know many people who are concerned about climate change are in favor of geoengineering, but I am not one of those. One thing that, that you pointed out in the Great Acceleration, I like this point, that, that, that I, I think the point you were making, that if we voluntarily as a species go into geoengineering that so far the anthropocene uh, 
And I agree with you, and, and I really appreciate you for stating this so eloquently. I wish I could find a sentence that up until this point, that our geological force has been, quote, unintentional, that it is that all of these problems that we have caused have been a, a natural but unintended accidental byproduct of global industrial civilization as people pursue wealth and uh, power and comfort. There you go. I mean, you have, you have zeroed in on this, the conspiracy wackos notwithstanding, but if we go into geoengineering, we are actually, you know, for the first time intending to, uh, to become a, literally a geological force. And am I correct on what you're saying about that? And it, it just takes us into a whole new level as a, as a species if we cross this line. Is that what you were trying to say? Yeah, it's theoretically possible that we could become conscious managers of the planet on which we live as opposed to unconscious uh, influencers <laughs> over the planet on which we live. And some people look forward to this. Some people have confidence that the human race is judicious enough and knowledgeable enough and skilled enough to manage a planet sensibly. As a historian, aware of many of the follies of the human race, I am extremely skeptical that we have what it takes to manage a planet. So I prefer not to try. I prefer to seek ways to reduce our impact on the planet rather than to embrace managing a planet. Okay, you, you mentioned skeptical. Does that translate to pessimistic so here we are we got to be wrapping up here pretty quick are you an optimist or a pessimist looking ahead uh, to the future historians writing the, uh, the 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 future historians writing the history of the environmental history of the 21st century are you optimistic or pessimistic about how their book is going to read in the 20 in the year 2200 I am a pessimist of the mind and an optimist of the heart. There you go. Uh, uh, oh, I, I like that answer. So, uh, follow your mind. Uh, yes, that's the left or right side of the brain. But, Dr. John R. McNeil, this is, I, I could go on with this. I mean, we have not even begun to open up so many avenues. I could sit here and talk to you all day, brother, but we are, uh, we are about to have a collapse of global industrial civilization here when this camera battery runs out. So how, stick around for a minute after we close, but in, in closing, I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked every other guest. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but actually had the mainstream media uh, sticking a microphone in your face, giving you 60 seconds to send out the John R. McNeil message to planet Earth in the year 2019, what would your 60 second soundbite uh, to the mainstream media and the planet sound like? Uh, it would sound like this. Hello, everybody. We've got some uh, urgent business, and our top priority at the moment should be focusing public policy on bringing about, as soon as possible, an energy transition so that we transition away from fossil fuels. And secondly, we should focus public policy on maximizing formal female education around the world which will have the happy uh, indirect effect of lowering fertility and stabilizing population and thereby reducing pressures further on global ecology. So that's what we should be doing, and uh, today's the day. <laughs>
Okay, well, with that, I, uh, I, I cannot argue with, with, with one bit of that. And John R. McNeil, we really appreciate you coming on this show. And folks, for anyone who has enjoyed this conversation and want to find out more, I cannot recommend too highly uh, his two books. Well, he actually has, has a lot more books, but, but the two that, that, that are must-reads uh, are The Great Acceleration and Something New Under the Sun, both of which you can find right there on goodoldamazon.com. But with that, we have got to say goodbye. John McNeil, thank you very much for joining us, and keep up the good fight. Thanks very much, Sam. I've enjoyed it. Okay, and we will pick this up next week. Bye, guys.